Welcome to Founders Field Notes, the podcast where you can learn from founders how to be founders. I'm founder and CEO of Klugonics Group, Jason Klug, and serial entrepreneur. This week's episode, we sat down with Allison Roberts, co-founder of Faster Size. What you see here is everybody faster sizing or shiver sizing, as they call it, is burning 500 calories in five minutes. Yes, that's right. I said 500 calories in five minutes. And this is science-backed weight loss and exercise that taps into our natural survival mechanisms by shivering, like when you're cold, but you get very creative ways of doing it naturally yourself. So Faster Size was originally created by Dr. Dennis Wilson, which is Allison's father, and together they took his knowledge and creative exercising technique called shiver sizing, and Allison put it together in a digestible platform, which is what we know as Faster Size. The great thing about this program, as you'll learn, is it's not about burning 500 calories in five minutes. It's about spreading this technique across your day in small segments before or after meals to help spike your metabolism and digest food quicker, you know, just burn calories throughout the day and create a better routine for a healthier way of life. So here's Allison Roberts. Check it out. Great conversation. Thanks for listening. So I've been testing the app a little bit. Which has been fun. Oh, fun. <laughs> Faster size. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty good app. I, you do a great job in those videos. Oh, thank you. The training. <laughs> you know, talk to me a little bit about what faster size is. We say that we're creating the quick burst fitness category. Mm -hmm. So quick burst exercise, meaning you do one minute of exercise at a time mm -hmm. as fast as possible. Yeah, throughout the day, right? <laughs> throughout the day. So yeah. you do one minute of exercise before a meal and then one minute of exercise after meal. You just kind of split it up like that. This was a concept that my dad came up with. Mm -hmm. So my dad's a medical doctor, 30 years of experience in thyroid and metabolism. Okay. So the background of faster size is super science deep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he researched for a long time, pulled together over 200 studies and wrote a book on this called The Power of Faster Size. Mm -hmm. And so this methodology shows how it's going to affect your mitochondria, the Krebs cycle, your circadian rhythm, your, mm. you know, insulin and counter-regulatory hormones. Like it goes super deep dive on how it affects your body. Mm -hmm. And then the exercises themselves are really easy to do. It's like super simple, super easy, super straightforward mm -hmm. exercises. Yeah. Cause like this morning, for example, I just started going to a personal trainer and it's like, Oh, I wake up at like 5 a.m. Then it's like I got to be there at six and it's like a full hour, you know, and then you're yeah, I mean, he like wrecks me for that whole hour doing like hit where like my heart rate's going like up to like 160 and then like wait until it goes down to 130 and then back up to 160 and like back and forth and back and forth. The the one minute thing, like I did it the other day and I was like trying it with the app and everything. And it was like, I don't know if I quite got to like full feeling that like sweatiness and stuff but I was or I was like my head was getting warm mm -hmm. and I felt like and I tried it before a meal and stuff and I get what you know that makes sense because you're like kicking your body into gear and then when you put the food in there it's like your body's like warmed up and like ready to digest it versus like being a blob on a couch and then eating a cheeseburger. <laughs> At least your body's like, you know, moving and grooving, going into a meal. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think at the end of this, we'll want to bring some of uh, a couple team members in here to do it, you know, yes. and do, do a little training. <laughs> Has your dad been doing this for a long time and, you know, kind of kept to himself about it and you want to, like, bring it to the world? How's that? How did that happen? Yeah, it's interesting. He had this discovery about this fitness program right before I had my first kid. Mm -hmm. So I have two kids mm -hmm. and my oldest is four. And so he kind of came up with this methodology right before I gave birth. I was like 39 weeks pregnant. Okay. <laughs> and so he told me about it and I just thought, all right, that's going to be my postpartum recovery plan. Like I'm going to try this. Um, cause like I'm that's a great. huge daddy's girl. Like mm -hmm. I, I've always loved my dad. And I even wrote in my journal when I was 12, I want to go to college and study business so I can come home and start a business with my dad. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, he's always come up with some really 
crazy ideas. He's invented so many things. Um, but I was like, yeah, I'll be your first guinea pig. So I had my baby and then I started doing this program and I did like five to 10 minutes of these exercises a day. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to my crazy results mm -hmm. entering a bodybuilding competition. That. <laughs> that's impressive that, you know, you're like, you're basically your own case study, mm -hmm. which is great. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a good way to prove it versus I'm sure a lot of these other, you know, fitness programs, the people that are putting on are usually like, you know, they aren't going like a body transformation. They're like going into it already, you know, a personal trainer, you know, ripped or whatever. And it's not, I don't know if they put themselves in their, their shoes, you mm. know, because it's like I've fluctuated in weight a bunch and it's like hard to get back on the bandwagon. Right now, I feel like I'm, I, I went through like a fat phase last year because my wife and I, she, she had our first baby mm -hmm. and she's like a, you know, big time marathon runner and stuff like that. So I saw her go through that, but also like the stress before the baby. And then also I was going through like business stuff where I was like buying a business partner out and that was like six months of stress. Oh, man. And so it was like, I felt like my cortisol levels were spiked and like, mm, I definitely sure gained like 25 pounds, <laughs> you know, through that, through that like six to eight month period. You know, I'm like, okay, I got to get back on it. And then, and then watching Kels, my wife go through it where like she has to get like the, one, the momentum to do it, especially like through breastfeeding and stuff. And it's been, I mean, it's tough. It's so hard. You know, and the personal trainer is like, yeah, let's just go. Just come, you know, just start. You know, it's like, okay, lift this. It's like, oh, okay. I mean, yeah. I think that's, that's one of the things that like... I feel like the movement that I'm building is the antithesis of the just do it mm -hmm. mentality mm -hmm. where, you know, just do it. It's like, what if I don't want to just do it? Mm -hmm. What if I can't just do it because my kid is over here throwing up and my house is a disaster and I need to leave for work in 20 minutes? Yeah. Like, I feel like because I experienced it myself, I really am closely <laughs> familiar with what it's like to be in real life. Mm -hmm. Not all of us at every point in our lives can carve out an hour to work out mm -hmm. three or four times a week. No, it's so it's so difficult at times. And it's it's not just like the time aspect, but also the motivation. Like I'll tell you this, coming out of having my first baby, like I had gained 35 pounds and my stomach was obviously stretched out mm -hmm. and like you look in the mirror and you don't recognize yourself mm -hmm. and I mean it's it's just such a gut punch like to your psyche. Mm -hmm. And then you add into that like post postpartum depression mm -hmm. and just this constant worry that you're never going to be good enough because you're met with like on Instagram and social media, you're met with these images of beautiful women who are just rocking bodies. And I mean, half the time those are even edited, mm -hmm. <laughs> like they're not even real, yeah. but it's just, you know, all of that pressure combines to make it really hard to even want to go to the gym. It's like, yeah. why do I want to subject myself to an ideal that I'll never reach? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to do with faster sizes, like give people the alternative of doing these exercises from the convenience of your own home. Don't even have to change your clothes. No judgment from mm -hmm. anyone. And mm -hmm. you can just start to see results like mm -hmm. easily <laughs> instead yeah. of, like you said, getting wrecked. Yeah. Like, I mean, I used to be a really gung ho athlete, like in high school. I was a like national elite athlete, so top 100 in track and cross country. I mean, I was I was so like in distance it. or yes. sprinting. So my distance? best event was two mile, but I did the one mile, two mile, and the 5K. Okay. So I mean, I pushed myself. Like I used to run 50 miles a week. Um, yeah. And I'd train for four hours a day. Yeah. Like I'm used to that. Mm -hmm. But not all of us are going to be high school athletes forever. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like then I, I started college. I got a job. I had kids. And it's like I would never dream of spending that much time on my physique now. Yeah, it's crazy because that my, my wife is the same with, you know, she was soccer in high school, got a scholarship and switched across country. She's, she likes to do marathon, you know, run. So she's, you know, done... Uh, Boston three times, Holy you know, crap. so she's like really into the, um, you know, she's like close to three hour marathon times. Oh my god! So gosh. she like loves distance running. There was a point when I met her that she was doing Ironmans, but doing half Ironmans is yeah. 70.3. I mean, still ridiculous. So and, you know, when I met her, she would be like, you know, wake up at 5 a.m., 
do like, you know, an hour and a half swim and then go ride the bike for an hour or whatever. And like, and it was just like, what? That's like a crazy lifestyle. It is. It's hard. Well, and you know, know, those types of fitness programs only work for 23% of the population. That's still a bigger chunk than I would expect. No, well, not her <laughs> specifically. She's like elite, probably yeah. like one third of a percent. Yeah. But like, you know, 77% of U.S. adults do not get enough exercise. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Right? Uh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I've been there, right? <laughs> I think we've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, that's what I thought when I jumped into the app, you know, I was expecting it to like, you know, show me the, the training and stuff. But then I started going through it and seeing how it's like, okay, you know, before lunch do this and it's, and it's broken up throughout the day. And so I got that immediately then understood that it was more about, or it's not just about the process of shiver sizing, but also, um, how to work it into your day when coming up with this, is that the whole goal with the app that is to basically train people and make it routine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I really would love to teach people to make it a routine because, you know, our goal is to help people find a fitness program that fits easily anytime. And so, of course, we're always going to have fresh content on the app. But if I could train someone to associate their hunger with doing shiver size, mm-hmm. I've succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because yeah. it's a it's a healthy lifestyle that you can do forever. Like mm-hmm. we were talking about, I can't train four hours a day anymore. Mm-hmm. Like I'll never get back to that. It's crazy life. It's so mm-hmm. it's so hard. Maybe if I try to do an Iron Man, that's like on my bucket list mm-hmm. one day. <laughs> um but but no, I mean if we can help people do this, I mean they'll be able to do it for life. We have people who are, you know, 70, 80, 90. Yeah. I think the oldest customer we've had was 96. Yeah. Wow. Doing faster size. That's incredible. So you'll never age out of it, mm-hmm. right? And it won't hurt your joints, but mm-hmm. The process behind faster size, again, it's very science-based. So one minute of shivering before a meal will burn so many calories that your hunger goes away for up to two hours. Mm -hmm. And that's because you're burning 120 times more energy over baseline when you do one minute of shivering, which 120 minutes... Yeah. Equals two hours, right? So that's kind of the math behind it. That's crazy. Um, and then once you eat and then you do a minute of exercise afterwards, that helps to build your muscles because it's taking all of the food and nutrients that you've got and directing them to the muscle groups that you would like to replenish mm-hmm. and build. And that's kind of the cycle because... We say to break it up, not only because it's more convenient to do just one minute at a time throughout the day, but also because you get more benefit by breaking it up. Mm -hmm. Like when you do one minute of shivering, that boosts your epinephrine and growth hormone for up to two hours afterwards, which can help with wound healing and mental focus. Mm -hmm. So like if you were to do five minutes of fast exercise in the morning, of course, that's going to be helpful, but it's not going to be as helpful as breaking it up because then it basically turns your normal everyday living into a workout right so yeah because I my one thing I learned because I did one of those executive health exams recently at like in, or, uh, the live well center at Intermountain Healthcare have you heard about that uh, I've not not this particular program like I'm whole interested day. it was pretty cool like you show up in the morning you do fasted metabolic rates so, so you like lay there and they hook you up and stuff and you breathe and you nap for a minute and then they hmm. get that test and then you eat and then you do uh, mobility stuff to show get an understanding of your mobility um, so you're doing like various movements and they got cameras on you and stuff and they can figure out like what parts of your body are stronger and weaker than others. Um, and then you do like, uh, the whole bod pod thing where you sit in the little air chamber and they test your, um, fat percentage and all that stuff. And then they did the running, you know, I ran on the treadmill with the mask on and stuff like that. and The did respirator. The whole, yeah. And that was harder than it looks, you know. <laughs> I mean, I did that for like, I ran for like 10 minutes and it was like the hardest run I've ever done. Because oh they like increase the elevation and you're running and they're like, okay, it's going to go faster now. And you keep going faster and faster. And you got this thing like restricting your breath a little bit. Um, this so to get your VO2 max, you know. Um, and then you do blood tests. Well, you start with the blood tests. So then those results come within the same day Mm. Uh, and you meet with doctors, a a nutritionist or a dietitian, all that stuff. So it was pretty, it was like really interesting and super valuable. And I thought 
I was going to have be in worse shape than I was, but it turned out it was like, I was like, okay, I've got something to work with here, but it was good. Cause it like motivated me. It's like, okay, now I have all this data and information. So as I continue to get better, I can see how I can improve and then actually have like, like when I go back and do like various tests, like I know what, how much I improved, mm. uh, which I thought was cool. But one of the things that I learned is when you do the, the testing on like metabolic rate and stuff like that, my metabolism is pretty slow. And one of the one well one of the reasons like hereditary like I'm pretty sure my dad's side of the family is just slow metabolism mm-hmm. so that's part of it, but at the same time I would do like keto a lot mm-hmm. and I would do like intermittent fasting yeah and I did that I think I did that for just like too long you know where I would like eat at like one you know and then eat another meal at like five or six and then try to not eat after that till the next day and I think I just did that too long. Versus really what I learned, it's like, okay, you, I, I need to eat breakfast and especially before a workout, like in the morning, I don't do faster workouts anymore. I get up, eat a small meal, like overnight oats or something, do the workout, come back, make sure I eat like protein. And then, you know, throughout the day, I have to make sure I snack and I eat smaller lunch, smaller dinner, but I've snacking in between. So I mm-hmm. don't have as much. And I basically learned that like, all this stuff I was learning on the internet about fasting and whatnot, it really made me like harder to get my, my metabolism back up and running at the rate that it should be at. Yep. And it just screwed me up. <laughs> so <I was> like, <laughs> well, you know? okay. So this is one thing that like, I, I want to help the world learn like mm-hmm. these items for fasting, because like you said, fasting can wreck your metabolism. Mm-hmm. And the reason behind that is this. When you are fasting, oftentimes you're hungry because you're going without food. Mm-hmm. And when you go around hungry, that's actually a sign that your body is burning muscle. Mm-hmm. So this is a discovery that my dad made. It's part of his book. And so when you're burning muscle, that the reason for that is when you're hungry, your body more easily metabolizes muscle before it can get to your fat stores. Mm-hmm. So when you go around hungry, you're slowly burning down your muscle. And when you look at calorie burn by by like material type muscle burns the most calories in your body at at like a resting spot Mm -hmm. then you know fat is like way in the back like fat burns almost no calories at rest Mm. so if you're constantly burning down your muscle because you're going around hungry all the time you're making your metabolism slower yeah which means that when you start eating normally again you're actually going to gain weight and then some because your metabolism is slower than it was before totally so like that is a as a not good place to be yeah and like with fast exercise, it's a little bit different because when you do these quick bursts of shivering exercise, Mm -hmm. it's such a demand of energy. It's a it's the most intense demand of energy possible. It's the fastest way to burn calories that the body has Mm -hmm. bar none. Mm -hmm. When you have that intense pull of energy, it forces your body to say, "Okay, we're going to skip over muscle because that's not calorie dense enough. We need the fat. It's like we're in an emergency situation. We need to access the fat right away. Mm -hmm. And so then it will start to burn the fat. And so it does a couple things. It maintains your muscle mass because your appetite has been satisfied by burning fat. Mm. So it's not like an appetite suppressant. It's an appetite satisfier because you're mobilizing fat store is to feed your hunger. Mm -hmm. And that's why your appetite will go away for up to two hours. We have an element of fasting in faster size. That's one of the reasons we called it this because you do go periods of time without eating. But the difference is you're not going around hungry. We tell people to almost never go around hungry because it's going to have Mm -hmm. all those negative effects that you talked about. Yeah. And so anyway, it's just it's crazy to me, like you can torture yourself and you can make yourself so miserable Mm -hmm. and it can actually make you worse off than you would have been if you had just eaten a cheeseburger. (laughs) Yeah, because well, it's like your body then thinks like and then when you do eat, your body's like, I better store this for later. Mm -hmm. I better, you know, pack that in my my, you know, my underarms or my (laughs) my gut. Right. And save that for later. So it's so as they're explaining this stuff to me. I'm like, damn, all that keto and stuff is not <laughs> good for me, <laughs> you know? So well, now I just try to like keep a more balanced diet, but yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing that makes a lot of sense, which I try to do, which 
is, you know, obviously if I do the morning workouts, like that's great. Like that'll probably last the energy I'd have from that will last throughout the day better. I feel like more focused and everything. But then later after lunch or whatever, before I have my after lunch snack, I'll go because we have a little gym out there. Did she show you that? Not yet. So we have like a little gym and I have a little hitting bay that I can hit golf balls in and I'll go and I'll just like hit some golf balls or do like some core work and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. It gives me another burst that then gets me through like the last few hours of the day. And then also when I get home, I'm not like burnt out. Totally. And I can switch to like dad mode a little better, (laughs) you know, because that's also hard, you know, when when it's like five o'clock, six o'clock and I get home and it's like, and I've had a long day, I have to flip that switch. And, you know, if I don't, then Kels will be disappointed in me. But, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, it, I mean, it, so then sustaining it throughout the day makes total sense. You go to school to get a business degree. Did you do anything after school to get experience in a startup or work for another company for a while? Or I what feel was like, the transition? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like the preferred method of choice, but like I, I hopped around so much that I feel like I kind of got startup experience. Um, Mm -hmm. I haven't worked at a startup before Faster Size, but Mm -hmm. when I, so I worked in HR, I stood up like a 300 person call center as an intern. Mm -hmm. And then I studied supply chain and minored in economics. Mm -hmm. And then I worked in data analytics uh, for like two years. And then I worked in financial analysis Mm -hmm. for Ford, actually. I was over their um, umbrella of startup companies. And so I did the financial analysis, like the financial reporting for, you know, cash flow Mm -hmm. and balance sheet, income statement, all those things. And so like you combine all those pieces, you got operations, data analytics, finance, Mm -hmm. HR, like So it was just kind of like, boom, 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 touching all these things. That's great. (laughs) And then I got to the point where it was like, I really don't like corporate America. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I, when I was in college, I feel like I almost, I almost got sucked into a career path that wouldn't have been great for me just because it was so applauded Mm. in my, in my major, the whole concept of climbing the corporate ladder and you know, working and getting a great salary, I really got sucked into that. And it took me like two years of being out of college to unlearn some of those things. Mm -hmm. Because I realized like, what I'm passionate about has nothing to do with what my friend is doing. Yeah. You know, I'm such a competitive person that to a fault, it was like, I want to do what they're doing and I want to be better than them at it because that means that I'm successful. And it mm-hmm. sounds horrible to say it out loud, but like, well, I, sometimes <laughs> that's what drives people too. I get yeah. it. Yeah, that's fair. And so it took me a couple of years of like working and I realized like my life is my life. Like I want to spend time doing things that I care about and I don't don't care if my friends think that this is prestigious. I don't care if my professors think that this is a waste of my time because like I love it and Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. That's great. So anyway, I gave myself permission to like do something I actually cared about. And I remembered like I wanted to start a business as early as 12 years old. Like, let's just go for it. And like, Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that I had no idea how hard it was going to be ahead of time. Like actually, um, I just had a conference with tacos together and Johnny Hanna was there and he said he, there was a quote he had on there it's like we didn't start this because it was easy we started this because we thought it would be easy mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like amen to that like yeah. i thought that starting a company would be just a cakewalk and um, it is not even close i you know met with a lot of uh entrepreneurs doing this and there's always different types of experience they come into it with. Some are more on the front end, marketing, sales, and so on and so forth. And then there's not as many that come in with the back end experience, like you're saying. You know, they, they the front end, they don't understand the financial side. And maybe they're not thinking through the unit economics or the uh, cash flow and all that type of stuff. And then building processes and stuff. So things run smoothly from the beginning versus they focus on sales and marketing and the product, which is great you know, obviously. And then they could build something that, you know, has legs and stuff, but then everything else on the back end just gets sloppy and messy, (laughs) you know, and that's like me, like I'm not organized. You'd see, I even showed up late for my own podcast, (laughs) but I surround myself with the Cora's and the Alyssa's and the, you know, the people that are really great at operations and, um, that helps for sure. 
Well, I feel like every you're gonna you're gonna have some rough patches, however, whichever direction you go, because like having the operations background and the financials, like yeah, those pieces were taken care of. But the selling part was the hard part for me, mm -hmm. like getting out there, telling people about my product, selling them on the idea, figuring mm -hmm. out what they liked, what they didn't like, and finding the product market fit. That was hard. Yeah, and like. I, f I so badly wish that I had just gone and done summer sales, mm -hmm. just pulled the plug. Like the dirty dog guy, like Bennett. <laughs> like Bennett. I interviewed him last, a couple weeks ago and yeah. his episode came out last week. And yeah, he was, he's, he's like the other side of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like he, he's selling solar and stuff like that. Now he's moving cookies, which I did get some over the weekend. They're very good. <laughs> They're, so good. <laughs> They're very good. Yeah. But that's, uh, but the, the interesting thing too, is that I was impressive about his story was, him then figuring out with the cookies, the operational side of making frozen pucks versus having them mix them at each shop and how much in machinery and labor and all that stuff it saves on the back end for the stores, which makes it better for the franchise owners. I mean, that's, yeah, you kind of have to then figure out the other side that you don't have and fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. You're forced to, right? Yeah. So then how did you figure out the sales side? Like, what are you doing to improve that and work through that side of the business? Yeah. So I realized that like you have no, you have no room to be like, to, to stay inside your shell and inside your comfort zone as a, as a founder, mm -hmm. like you, you just have to be incredibly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I started going to events. I started talking to my friends. And one of the nice things too, is my dad having all of this experience and like, I mean, he's trained thousands of doctors all over the world mm -hmm. on his discoveries. That's cool. Um, so we had a huge group of people to pull from, from there. So like we started going to medical conferences and teaching people and actually mm -hmm certifying people on faster size. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, like getting affiliates who are maybe naturopathic doctors or who are nutritionists and then the word of mouth that grows from there as well. So the go to market strategy that we've landed on now is we have all of these affiliates and they're also like ambassadors for the for the company. So they create like UGC for us, mm -hmm. user generated content. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure most people know what that is, but you yeah, never know. Big these days. Um, and then also just like getting it in front of their audiences. So to that end, um, we've brought on Inger Erickson. So she was uh, she built the affiliate program at Gab Wireless. Okay. The first three years, mm -hmm. I think she brought in like seventy million in sales for wow. them for the first three years. That's huge. So she's our vice president of sales. That's Yay. exciting. Is that new then? <laughs> that's new. That's, that's uh, really exciting. She signed the paperwork this last week. That's really exciting. Yeah. Congrats. So I'm 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 stoked, and I feel like you spend so much time like in the struggle. And this is actually the first time I've talked about this. Like. Mm -hmm. We spent, you know, a couple of years like building the platform and testing it out and trying mm -hmm. to find the customers. I mean, it was so painful. It was so painful. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't think with such an easy fitness program that it would be hard. But like there's just so much to business that you have to figure out. But anyway, this last quarter has been enormous for our company. Like we brought on Inger. We've mm -hmm. had at least like 19% month over month growth as high as like 55% month over month growth for our annual recurring revenue. That's great. For the last six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and then we also have Austin, right? Like he's now our, our president and he's helping with a lot of different things, but like he exited from two weight loss apps, mm -hmm. lose it and challenges, which were acquired by fit now, like six months ago. Wow. And so he's joined the team as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you have this dream and you keep pushing and you keep pushing and you keep pushing. And finally, you have people who come in and resources that really start to make things go. Mm -hmm. <sighs> it's yeah. just such a relief. Oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I mean, I, my first, like, you know, I, like I said, I started this 10 years ago, the first, you know, five and a half, six years were horrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? So bad. Right, where it's like, I, I, I would have to, there was a long, like even just four years ago, I was sleeping on like a foam pad in a, in a house trying to save on rent. So I was paying like 300 bucks a month rent um, just so I could pay everybody before me, you know, and I didn't have to like be a liability to the company. And that's after I already grinded for five something years and I had to be so patient, you know? So yeah, I get it. It's tough, but you know, I mean, now obviously things have changed, you know, we're in the 
tens of millions versus the hundreds of thousands, you know, but it's still, uh, I feel like that grind is the, adds the character and, and like, it's important in building the business, you know? And it's, it almost like makes it make, it almost shows you how much you want it by having to go through that versus if you, you know, after uh, six months of doing that, you give up, then, then the product probably wasn't right. But if you push through the first year or two of that type of struggle and that hardships and the, the building and the testing and then failing and then redoing it and stuff like that, it shows that you, you know, you, you just have a stronger mindset towards the product you're building. No, I, so that's valuable. I completely agree. And I, ah, you put that so well, like I didn't even think about that, but I want this so bad. Mm -hmm. And it, well, and surrounding yourself <laughs> with a team like you're doing, it's like, that's also when it gets really exciting is when you start bringing on team members that one, you know, are there to grind it out with you, but also believe in it when they have experience and stuff, it's like so validating. Uh, and it just makes things, it, it starts to build that momentum, that snowball effect, you mm -hmm. know, and it starts to like spool up and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that's, you're only at the beginning of it. Yeah. And then other problems happen. Good thing you have some <laughs> HR experience, right? Because then that starts totally. to come into play. Well, I'm sure, I'm, well, I mean, we've had people leave the team and we've had, we've had yeah. our own struggles. I'm not going to get into that yeah, piece. That but, yeah. but like up to what you're saying though, you know, this is, this is a field notes podcast for founders, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, going through that, I just told someone the other day, it's like, it was like hell fire brimstone misery <laughs> mm -hmm. just just a horrible place to be uh for for a lot of reasons like you know you think it's a great product but people aren't banging down your door to buy it and uh you know then it's like well what am i doing wrong and like i i wasn't taking a salary like mm -hmm. you were talking about i wasn't mm -hmm. taking a salary because i was putting everything back into the business and it's mm -hmm. like i'm not getting paid mm -hmm. and i am working harder than just about anybody that I know, right. I'm working my butt off and mm -hmm. I'm not getting any monetary value. And mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's just, it takes such a toll on your psyche, but like what you're talking about, I mean, character building for sure. But like, it comes back to the fact that I want this so bad. I will, I will either kill myself or torpedo my career or this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you need to have that level of commitment if you're trying mm -hmm. to create something new. Right. right. That's that's one other thing, too. I was talking with somebody's like when you're creating something that has been duplicated over and over again, like you're buying property and you're going to rent it out. Mm -hmm. That's a model that has been done tons of times. Right. That's nothing new. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you're trying to create something that has never existed before and for which you have absolutely no model, mm -hmm. it is going to be so difficult and yeah. you need to give yourself grace, but also, you know, work and work and work to make it happen because it's possible. It's just really hard. <laughs> yeah, and patience. Patience. Totally. Yeah, Cause it's like, even still today, it's not like I've sold any of my companies you know, it's not like I've had a big payout or anything. It's all cash flow based. So it's like, if I were to focus solely on, I know I built one of my brands for like an exitable thing, but even if I had the mindset towards that company as like, all that matters is the exit, then it would never yield what it could yield because that's all I was focused on mm -hmm. versus, you know, focusing on the, the monthly goals and the stepping stones that it takes to get there instead. And like working, you know, looking inward consistently versus like looking way too far ahead to what it could eventually be. Yeah. And it's like hard to do that at times. Right. And I, what you're talking about is mm -hmm. something I've learned, which is the internal motivation, mm -hmm. right? Because there's the external motivation. I'd love to sell this company one day, mm -hmm. you know, make millions and millions of dollars mm -hmm. off of an exit. Mm -hmm. But that's an external motivation over which you have no direct control, mm -hmm. right? Other people are going to have to make decisions for that to happen. Yeah. But what you're talking about is the internal motivation where it's like, I can set this goal and I can make sure that we have this product and we have this timeline and we meet right. our deliverables. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that you can control. And like, that's what I've shifted my focus to away from like all these accolades and the potential of like, you know, 
one of my coveted titles is Forbes 30 Under 30. Mm -hmm. oh, I want it so bad. I wanted it so bad. I already <laughs> missed it. <but. laughs> and it's like, it's not the end of the world. Like, I realize that's an external motivation over which I really have no control. I can only control my actions and mm -hmm. I can control what I'm working on and how. And I need to kind of push the other things to the side because that will, that will oftentimes deflate motivation mm -hmm. and discourage you as opposed to driving the real progress that you're right. making. Well, only if I knew that you actually had to be nominated or have someone nominate you. I, <laughs> you I just thought it was going to materialize? I don't know. I don't know how it worked. <laughs> I didn't know how it worked. I never looked into it. I was like too focused and head down, you know? And then I talked to uh, Travis Chambers who got it and he just game the system to get it. Really? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's like a total, um, you know, you just got to get the right nomination, build the right case, and, you know, you could get in there. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm 33 hilarious. now, so it's, like, too late, uh, which is a bummer. Cause, <laughs> you know, but it, yeah, definitely, uh, I would start getting uh, nominated as much as you can now. You might as well. Hey, might as well. I'm 28. Yeah. I just you, turned you 28. Some time. A couple years to go. I got this year and next yeah. year have yeah. my opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> so did, uh, is the company, did you fundraise? for it? Are you, are you bootstrapping it? Yeah. So we've bootstrapped everything up to this point, um, except for we got an angel check from Craig Earnshaw in mm -hmm. December of That's last exciting. year. Yeah, yeah. So that was fun. And now we're fundraising. We're doing a 1.5 million round. Mm -hmm. um, we've got 200,000 committed capital. Um, Good start. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're just, we're looking for a lead investor. So mm -hmm. we kind of, I've been fundraising like through this, like the beginning of this year, but we kind of took a pause on it when we brought on Austin and Inger because uh -huh. so much has changed since yeah. then. And luckily, like we have really low cash burn. So mm -hmm. like we could probably survive indefinitely with the revenue that we have and That's like great. limited cash burn. Mm -hmm. So we're not we're not desperate to get the money. But on the flip side, this industry is going to go like, oh, yeah. there are, I mean, I've pulled out, like, so many articles from big organizations like Time Magazine, Wall Street Journal, CNN, National Geographic, mm. all talking about what quick bursts of exercise for, like, one or two minutes throughout the day can do for you. Mm -hmm. And there is no other commercial option for it. Yeah. Like this is a new category that we're building. That's great. And so I'm not, I'm not anxious from a sense of like, we're going to have to shut our doors in four yeah. months if we don't get funded. But it's mm -hmm. like, we have a prime opportunity right now to build an incredible category within the fitness industry. Mm -hmm. And I want to do this as fast and responsibly as possible. Yeah. So you know, keeping the burn rate low, sometimes fundraising throws that off as well, which is, you know, better to almost like not rush into it. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's like you if you have all that, if you have that giant dinner plate, have you read that book Profit First? Mm -mm. This is one of my favorite books. And it's like basically if you have a big dinner plate where your checking account has a stack of cash in it, you're going to make different decisions versus if you had a quarter of that cash. So basically every dollar that comes in, you split it up immediately and only leave behind and work off of what is, you know, based on your percentage breakdown of how you split up your cash. Mm. So it's like I have my companies are split into four accounts where it's like I have a, a operating expense account, then I have a profit account, then I have a tax account, and then an owner's compensation account. Mm. And if every single dollar gets split up where 50% goes here, 15 here, 15 here, and 20 there, or whatever, you just, you're, that operating expense account stays at a, a smaller rate, and then the profit is almost like hidden from you. So it changes your 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 decision-making capabilities. That's so smart. And it, <laughs> and it keeps the EBITDA stronger and like keeps you healthier in making decisions. Yeah, definitely something I'd look at. But if you're already doing that from the beginning, then it changes how you build the company versus sometimes if, you know, a company raises a shit ton of money, they might go, okay, we need to hire this. 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 Okay. Let's fill all these gaps. Let's invest in this and let's spend this. And then before you know it, you're 75% of the way through your capital. And then you have a huge burn rate. And then it's like, well, I got to do another round you know, versus yeah. just constantly focusing on stabilizing and keeping your bottom line healthy throughout and making decisions based on that. Yeah. Because there's pressure on you when you have investors, you know, and they, they, they want you to spend the money to grow. 
Yeah, that can like change trajectory and stuff like that. It could be very difficult to, you know, have those voices on your shoulder. Well, and like that's that's one thing too. I mean, Inger was saying we could probably just grow our revenues to the point where we don't need to take investment, yeah. mm -hmm. especially with like I mean a tech company, mm -hmm. totally different from a manufacturing company. But yeah. like our margins, I mean, the cost per additional customer is absurdly low every month. Mm -hmm. We're talking cents. Yeah. Like maybe it's five great. to 10 cents per person, That's right? That's great. And so anyway, it's always a balance though, because you you want to grow fast enough to be competitive, but you also don't want to give up the keys to the kingdom, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to sell the farm. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, I've heard I've heard so many horror stories from both sides. Like, okay, I, I, I got big investors, and then I was left with like 5% of my company and I really didn't get the kind of payout that I was looking for and I regret it completely. Mm -hmm. And then the other side is, you know, I tried to bootstrap for this for too long and I'm just so burned out and so tired from trying to grow this at such a slow pace, like I quit. Mm -hmm. And it's just... Yeah, you got to find that balance. There's got to be a balance. Yeah, that is good though. You're able to, at least you're building an app in a platform that is... You know, there is value in the the monthly fee for the user, you know, totally. and it's not it's not like the freemium model or whatever like that. It's you, you're you're going to get cash flow right off the bat, right after the customer is acquired. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm guessing the customer becomes profitable very quickly after they download and within the first month, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's also a big benefit that your business model as a whole, I feel like, is is great. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Compared to some other apps and stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> so being the financial analyst that I am, mm -hmm. I made like 10 different financial and like financial models mm -hmm. for all of these different methods where we've got freemium, we've got like upsell versions, we've got uh, corporate bulk accounts, we've got direct to consumer, mm -hmm. we've got, I mean, I just, I broke it all out. Yeah. And it's very quickly to see, like, okay, that would not be profitable. That would be an impossible number to hit. Like, yeah. <laughs> or nope, nope, nope. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so people are always going to have their opinions. But, like, I always go back to the data. Like, yeah. the data is going to set you free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And, of course, you can't have perfect data. But, like, if it's going to take you 200 million downloads to be able to break even, that's probably wow. not, great, not a great yeah. business model. That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and in, and in, in what things since you started have evolved and changed since you started bringing on these advi or these other team members, these experienced team members? Yeah, I mean, we are we're rebranding. Okay, that's probably the biggest one. That's First, hard, yeah. we're in the middle of that, and like, I'm here for it. Like. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be great. Um, so we're rebranding. And then in addition to that, we are thinking about the strategy of what we're raising and why, mm -hmm. because we may not need to raise 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. It could be as simple as a few hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And then at that point, we would have enough revenue to just carry us. Yeah. Um, and so like talking the strategy of how much to raise, when to raise it rebranding the company and then also like how to maximize signups for affiliates because mm -hmm. one of the things about faster sales i'm sure you've noticed this it's a little weird mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of a strange fitness yeah. program it's it's shivering like this and so if someone saw this on social media a lot of the time people think it's like clickbait and yeah. i don't blame them for that there is so much misinformation out there mm -hmm. and so what our struggle is is to help people recognize like no this is a legitimate fitness program and it's totally Totally backed by science, probably more scientific than almost any other fitness program you've tried. Yeah. Um, and so to do that, it comes from word of mouth. And that's why like word of mouth has been so big for us. Like 23% of our signups come from affiliates mm. and 52% come from word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And so being able to combine those two creates a great flywheel for us. So we get more influencers instantly. You know, we've got even higher levels of engagement that yep. will then drive word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember where I was going with that. Yeah, the but, changes that oh, yeah. the, the changes <laughs> that have come from your team. Yeah. Yep. So and yeah. I one of the things that Inger said is like we're gonna have to change the branding. Okay. to be able to be like more believable mm -hmm. because they told us that like faster size sounds a lot like jazzer size, which oh, it does. Yeah. Huh. And um it also sounds like it's from the eighties. 
okay. which is great for Stranger Things, but little else in this world. Sure. All right. <laughs> um, and so, and people don't know how to spell it. And I'm not going to put you on the spot by mm-hmm. asking you how to spell it, but I did a an in person survey mm-hmm. a couple days ago, and I asked people how to spell faster size, and I got a different answer every single time. Was it, is it F A S T E R Z I Z E? Right. Is that right? No. No. I mean, what? So it's it's we oh, call it C I Z E C I S E. See, but there are so yeah. many ways you could spell it, totally. right? And that it sounds like faster Z I Z E. Yeah. So um yeah, it's just a nightmare. So we're we're rebranding. I get it. My company's called Klugonics. No one knows how to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <Yeah>. So. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's not quite as bad for you because your whole business is not based around word of mouth, yeah, right? B two B. I mean, it can, a little bit of referral and stuff like that, and just sales hustle. But right. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm not trying to get every consumer on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to have people telling their friends how to spell it and then looking it up online, like yeah. to download it. But uh, anyway, so it's it's been fun, and I'm I'm so grateful for their expertise. Mm-hmm. And this is one other thing. Like, I actually have a book that I'd like to write at some point. Um, definitely not going to get to it for a long time, but like. The idea of bringing on like really great team members and then completely stepping back and letting them run their show. Oh yeah, I do that for sure. So important. It's way better right? way to go because then when it takes it, when you're not going to explode, you know, because that definitely is the case. Uh, and I've seen it even with past business partners where you know they try to get they they can't let go of anything. <laughs> Um, versus like, I just let the departments go. And if a problem comes up, they'll come to me and ask me for help. But, you know, if I try to get in there and manhandle it all, it just never works. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It would never work for me personally, but also it wouldn't work for them. Because mm-hmm. then they, they can't do their thing and do their thing well, which is why I hired them. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, it's definitely a... A skill to have. Well, and I, I, my first manager ever, again, not going to use names, Mm -hmm. but my first manager ever was the epitome of micromanagement. Mm -hmm. I would get a list of 10 things to do in a day and I'd ask, okay, what's the highest priority? What should I focus on first? And Mm -hmm. I'd get the answer. It's all top priority. Just get to work. And then they would come (laughs) in and check on me every 20 minutes. How much progress have you made? Is this done yet? And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I cannot. (laughs) cannot do this. Um, So then on the flip side, like I think a method that really works for me is we get really great people on the team and then you let them run their, their area. And then also you set up a system in place that allows the system to hold activity accountable, Mm -hmm. right? Because you don't just want to, you don't just want to let things go because deadlines create a sense of urgency and like you are more productive when you have a deadline, right? Mm -hmm. But you also don't want to be a bad guy manager. And so if you have a system that you create together where it's like, okay, these are the deadlines that we want to hit. This is the initiative that we're working on to get there. And we're going to finish, we're going to, we're going to review this in three weeks and Mm -hmm. see what progress we've made. Mm -hmm. Again, I can't take credit for this. Austin, right, has been incredibly helpful in teaching me some of this scrum and Kanban type stuff. Mm. Um, but like that, ah, I just, it just feels good. It, it, it allows people to have pride in their work and ownership of what they're doing. Mm-hmm. It allows you to step back and to not be like I'm t- stepping on any toes. And it also provides an additional layer of accountability so that people know that like, yep, the work that I'm doing today matters. It's important. And we're going to review this. So I'm just going to do the best that I can. And what parts do you then focus on? Personally, like what is your your part of the business that you want to continue to focus on? And uh, yeah, I mean, I going forward, I think I'm definitely going to be like the spokesperson for Faster Size and really try to, um, you know, speak with customers and speak with industry experts and try to get the word out about it. Because one thing that we also realized is Faster Size is not just a company; it's a movement, mm-hmm. right? It's a movement of a movement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so. I need to be out there just preaching and evangelizing and talking and engaging. And, um, you know, one of my biggest goals is to get on Good Morning America. Yeah. 
I just feel like it would be a perfect cool. one, right? I yeah. mean, I think they would enjoy to hear about this yeah, this exercise on camera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking about the the uh, visually. If you're just sitting there showing people and getting the reaction of how they feel after a minute and stuff, doing it like that's like really all it takes. Yeah. Right. Well, not all it takes. But you know what I mean? It's a lot. Like no. it, it shows a lot and speaks a lot to the process of shiver sizing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Speaking of which. Did did this come from like being cold? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the idea behind it is like, you know, my dad found shivering is the body's fastest way to burn calories. Mm-hmm. And then he thought, well, what if you didn't have to be cold to shiver? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a weird thought, but you don't oh, have to be cold to shiver. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you just do the movement and you get almost all of the calorie burning benefits from that. Mm-hmm. And then going back to your metabolism, these exercises overwhelm your mitochondria, the mm-hmm. powerhouses of your cells which form almost all of your metabolic rate as well. Mm -hmm. So these exercises cause your mitochondria to grow in size and number, which then increases your metabolism Mm -hmm. and helps you to like be able to keep weight off even if you stop fast exercising. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, the whole concept of shivering without being cold does take a little bit of time for people to understand. It's like, what do you just get in a cold plunge? (laughs) It's like, well, you Mm. could, but a lot of people don't want to do that. And I haven't actually done one. A cold plunge? Mm. Oh, it's so hard. I like, oh man. I want to though. (laughs) I'm like down to try it, but I haven't actually, yeah. Like one time I was in Hong Kong at the, uh, at the, uh, there's the Ritz Carlton down there has one set up like that. Oh man. And you like, it has like a cold plunge next to a hot tub. And I was like, all right, I'm going to try it. And I like got, and I like dunked in and immediately got out and then got into the hot tub. And I was so uncomfortable because the hot tub was in super hot. And that was my only experience doing it. And I haven't done it since then. <laughs> so shout out to Mitch Matthews. <laughs> he's, he's another founder here in Utah. So okay. he's actually building a spa that's going to have a cold plunge and a, and a hot tub, mm-hmm. and, and they're going to have programs where you cycle between cold plunge for a few minutes, hot tub for a few minutes, and yeah. you go back and forth for an hour. Wow. And, like, I will try it. I am nervous. I'll, I'll try it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm nervous as well. Because you just know you're going to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Or the people are like, yeah, let's do a cold shower. I've even tried that, and it's like like 15 <laughs> seconds I could do it for. It's so hard. Yeah. My dad has a cold plunge, and, like, kudos to him. I mean, he'll try anything to be healthy, but but like I I feel like I'm I follow the 80 20 rule when mm-hmm. it comes to my fitness. It's like okay. I will do the most straightforward, easiest method to get 80 percent of the benefits. Mm-hmm. And that's good enough for me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. All right. So let's talk about like the future like what are some of the goals in building this company? Like what what are current milestones you're working on right now? Other than acquiring customers, obviously like the rebrand stuff, like what are active things that you're trying to, to, to work on to make this year better? Yeah, we have a goal like within, you know, within this year, we want to hit um, a million dollars in annual recurring revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, if not like actual, then at least projected, yeah. <laughs> you know, make those signups. Let's see how many users is that? Uh, well, and it depends too, but like, it'll be a combination of the ARR for, a, month, a yearly subscription and a monthly subscription. But I think... It's like 30,000 users. Is yeah, that about right? Something like that. Something like okay. that. That's um, totally doable. It is totally doable. totally doable. And so that's one of the milestones that we have. In addition to that, like, we want to start getting um, international interest. So mm. we're we're going after we finish the rebrand and we've gotten the affiliate program really humming under Inger, mm. we're going to go to the U.N., and we're going to talk to them because they have goals like, you know, the, we their third goal for this year is to help improve like wellness around obesity. Mm-hmm. And like, I mean, heck, we can help mm-hmm. with that for sure. Yeah. Um, and so like we want to go to some of these large organizations and that's kind of we we've broken it down between like 70 percent of our effort is going to go towards like affiliates and direct to consumer sales. And then 20 percent is going to go to some of these organizational things like the VA, mm-hmm. like the UN and you know some of these uh, we've also been talking with Native American tribes uh, that want to help reduce the likelihood of like obesity and Mm -hmm. diabetes Mm -hmm. and so get some of these organizational 
partnerships in place as well. Um, I just, I'm really excited to help as many people do this as possible. And like, we want to go international because, you know, the U S is definitely leading out in poor health. We are the largest country with the poorest health Mm -hmm. out there. Um, but there are a lot of other countries that are also starting to struggle like the middle East, you know, their health rates are declining a lot. And same thing with South America. Like we are likely not going to be a Utah company. Like we're not going to be even maybe a United States company. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of our customers are going to be coming from all over the globe. Mm -hmm. And like, that's something we've already seen. We have been downloaded in 33 country code so far. That's great. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, we've only advertised in the United States and Mm -hmm. then everything else has come from word of mouth and we're talking every continent. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. um, Um, Just... (laughs) <laughs> and the app is only in English as right. well. Like we're so how probably. Do you, how do you find out where they came from right now? Well, that's just part of you the sign up them? process. Well, how did you find us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Luckily we take, we can take the IP address and I think they have to select their country as well. Yeah. But I mean, it's, I've never been to most of the countries that it's been downloaded and that's exciting for me. That's exciting. Yeah, you know? that's cool. It's cool to have an impact that can help people, even if you'll never meet them in person. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the goal. I mean, we might start translating the platform into like Portuguese and Spanish. In fact, cool. we have partners who are affiliates for ours, and they've offered to translate the app into Spanish and Portuguese free of charge because mm-hmm. they want to open up their markets to faster size. Yeah. And it's not really available right now because most people don't speak English. So do you have to do the, the voiceover on the videos and stuff as part of it? Yeah, I'm not going to. I was going to say, do you, get a pick, do you get to pick the voice for yourself? <laughs> That's a fun That'd process. Be, um, will, would there be an option to do like AI voiceover in Portuguese, but use yeah. my intonations? Oh, that'd be that cool. might be interesting That's to neat. look into. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. I mean, it's consumer product businesses to get physical goods into other countries is so much more difficult versus an app, you know? Yeah. I mean, we have to do the packaging and stuff like that with the different languages, but like supply chain set up in the other countries. So, so it's huge benefit to be able to scale an app into other countries like that and already have users in other countries and a huge thing to take advantage of. Yeah. Cause I was thinking too, it's like the other great thing about the product is it's not, you know, you could get, like you said, the elderly, you know, that, that can't get up and lift weights and do big workouts mm-hmm. using it. You can get, you know, the busy, you know, person that works, you know, a CEO or whatever, like executive team that needs to use it and they could do it on their lunch break or before they do lunch and whatnot. And then you can get someone that's already extremely fit that maybe uses it as something to sustain themselves throughout the day. Cause you know how people like that, like Kelsey, for example, you know, if she doesn't work out, her day is just shot, you know, yep. and having a tool like this where she can get those bursts throughout the day would probably only help with like mood stabilizing and stuff like that. But um, I mean, you don't really have a limit to your market, which is great. <laughs> and that's that's also it's like a two edged sword because mm-hmm. it is really awesome to not have a limit. Mm-hmm. It's also it was hard for us to focus because yeah. it's like we could take this. I mean, there are mm-hmm. no less than 14 business models that we could sustain mm-hmm. with this. And so, um, you know, it took time. It's like we got to be disciplined. You know, we're a small team and this application and this this fitness program can help billions of people. Mm-hmm. I mean, there there is no limit to how many people this can help, but we can only successfully target one group at a time. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And so like we had to just tell ourselves, it's like, look, we're not going to like avoid these people for the rest of eternity. It's just we have to pick one. We mm-hmm. have to pick one that's the most productive. And so mm-hmm. that's why we picked very busy professional women mm-hmm. who also happen to have children or mm-hmm. pets. Like yeah. and it's it's a, like a direct reflection of me. No, <laughs> right. <it makes> sense. <laughs> yeah. But those are the people who have so many demands on their time that they are going to truly like love the option of doing five mm-hmm. minutes a day. And also, you know, they have the motivation, but they don't have the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you combine those things. And then of course, ladies like me, we're going to tell our friends. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's the target demographic that we're focusing on right now. And then we'll, you know, start to get into more organizations. But like, I am really excited to like help people in all those 
all those places you talked about mm-hmm. to get in shape because I feel like this is kind of a next step for fitness for humanity, right? Like we've done weightlifting, we've done running, we've done, you know, all kinds of different exercises, CrossFit, like, but you think about it, they're all, they're all very similar in the sense of like, you put in the time to burn the calories Mm -hmm. and you do this just a couple times a week. Like if you boil it down, that's kind of what it is. And I feel like this is kind of the next step where it's like, what if you only did one minute at a time and you could get all of these benefits. Then you do it. You don't have any requirements on space and stuff like that. The other thing that I think is great is it's like, you know, someone that's at you know working a, a day job or whatever, they're not going to want to do a huge workout and get all sweaty and stuff like that. Versus this, they can do in their regular whatever outfit they're wearing, yeah. bust it out, and then they're also not, you know, yeah, just drenched and and you know. F- Face is red and stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. Like after a big workout, you're like, you know, you don't want to see anybody. Versus, you can do. I could do it in here. Walk out there and, you know, have lunch or whatever, and it's no one would know. Right. <laughs> which is which is weird at the same time, but it makes it super valuable. Yeah. For, from a, uh, yeah. Well, and that's that's what I did too. Like when I was training for my bodybuilding competition, mm-hmm. I just did like five to 10 minutes of exercise and I would break it up two minutes in a conference room and just pray that nobody no was going to enter. <laughs> <laughs> it happened like once or twice and I just dropped to the floor and started doing push-ups right. so that people were like, oh, okay, it's yeah, a workout. Yeah. Um, yeah. But well, like, the, uh, that should be a goal then is to make it so when people see people shiver size and they don't understand, they, they don't question what it is versus just going, oh, they're just doing a little shiver size sesh. Oh, yeah. That's and a, like, that would be a great goal for you as a company. What a milestone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because like if you see someone doing this right now, mm-hmm. people are gonna be like, "Are you okay?" Like yeah. they think that you're having a seizure or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if um, you're doing the dead bug one, <laughs> you know, yes, which is, it sounds like that that one seemed to be like my favorite out of them, you know, because it's like you get the core engaged and stuff, so it, it you know it's makes a the tough most workout. sense, <laughs> you know. Versus, I, I'm just trying to think back to. Um, you know, the fifties, if someone was sitting there doing burpees or something would you know, how would people perceive that? Oh, and now yeah. it's normal. So I, and I completely agree. I'm so glad you brought that up because if you actually go back running like along the road or just running outside was not socially acceptable until like the late 1960s. That's crazy to think about. Right. Yeah. It's like if you were running outside, someone would be like, where's the fire? Mm -hmm. And they're like, but nobody would think that you do it for exercise. Mm -hmm. And so it was like 1968, I think. So like, I mean, if we can, if we can normalize running in the streets, yeah. <laughs> I think we can probably normalize yeah. shivering. That makes sense. Might take a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, you know, you're in it for the long haul, right? Yeah. So t- what are some good leave behind field notes that you'd want to, you know, tell other entrepreneurs right now? Some things that you've learned over the last few years that you want people to make sure they don't make the same mistake or, you know, or the things that have propelled you recently that you would want to in- make sure people know. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say I think the first thing is to to address your fears as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And I feel I wish that I had done that. And I like I like to consider myself a fearless person, but I'm not Mm -hmm. like I don't think anyone's truly fearless. I was I was honestly scared of selling. I was scared of people telling me that they hated my product or that they hated me. I Mm -hmm. mean, you have these crazy ideas that people are just going to come at you because Mm -hmm. you're starting a business. And that might be true. But yeah. You have to face those fears immediately and as quickly as possible, because if you don't, they are going to slow you down. They are going to hold you back and it might choke the life out of your business over such a long period of time that you just don't succeed. Yeah. And so, like, I mean, I got close to the point where it's like, this is so painful. I just want to quit. And I don't feel like I would have gotten to that point if I had faced my fears earlier. Mm -hmm. And just gotten out there and started talking about my business. Yeah. Um, so like lessons learned, you know, I'll never do that again. Second thing. That's a great note, though. <laughs> it's yeah. so true. Uh, it's it's tough. It's tough. And like, I think that that also comes to you have to live in truth with yourself. Mm-hmm. Like. You have to you have to accept what is happening and what you are doing and not live in the fantasy world of like, oh, things are going great. Like, I guess 
the the short version of it is don't look at vanity metrics because vanity metrics are not going to drive the business. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you know, we got downloaded in 33 country codes. Like, that's a more of what I would call a vanity metric mm-hmm. because it's not actually driving the revenue that our business needs to succeed, yeah. right? But it's, it's cool, yeah. right? It but, shows that, there, that at least the opportunity is exactly. in 33 countries, which yeah. is still, yeah, that's and another, a great thing to like, look at. A vanity metric would definitely be like Forbes 30 under 30. Yeah. I mean, no, <laughs> they're, good, they're good for your, your yourself, right? Yeah. But yeah, you're right. They maybe don't add to the top or bottom line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so like, and this is something we talk about in, in like weight loss. You could almost look at like how many pounds you've lost as a vanity metric, mm-hmm. because that's a result of the actions of the activity that you do. Mm-hmm. And so instead of focusing on that result, focus on what are you going to do today to get these results mm-hmm. and track that, track the activity, not as much just the results. Yeah. I would almost track the activity more than the results because the results will come when you do the activities, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and like I, I just <laughs> sticking to a routine and hitting those. Mm-hmm. I did. I, I successfully did my shiver size every day for an entire week. Yes. You know, that that's more of the focus versus exactly. I lost a pound a week or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's what they told me I had to lose is a pound a week. That's my goal. And it's like, that's it. You can do that. Yeah. No, it's easy. It's totally <laughs> doable, you know, but that's a good thing to look or a good way to look at it. Yeah. So focus, focus on the actions and also the results. Um, and then I guess the last thing is like, don't like sell your passion or your experience short, because I feel like so much of the time, you know, looking at anybody who is, who is farther down the road than you are, you're going to feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like I was saying, I could look at you and just be like, man, Mm -hmm. Jason is so successful. He's built an incredible business. They have tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Like Mm -hmm. I'll never get there. You know, I'm, (laughs) (laughs) but my, my, thank you. I I hope so. Mm -hmm. But my point is like you, you don't realize that every single person who has gotten where you want to be, like they have their own issues and their own struggles to totally. work through. And like you have skills that you may discount and discredit just because it's yours. Mm-hmm. And maybe people aren't like me, but this is something that I've done. It's like, well, if I did it, it must be easy. So it's probably not that impressive. Mm. And I've gone to therapy to work through this mentality. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, I do the same. I go to therapy for all kinds of stuff, you mm-hmm. know. And to that point, though, it's like when I when you look at myself, like I have the I, I think the same thing about the next person. So no matter what, that's like, you know you're always going to think that way. Even when you get to the, you know, the tens of millions of dollars, you're going to be looking at someone that's in the hundreds of millions of dollars and thinking the exact same thing. I feel like that doesn't go away no matter what. <laughs> I mean, I bet I, I'd be curious to hear what, like who Jeff Bezos is thinking about or Elon Musk. <laughs> don't you, know you what think I mean? there's like a limit though? I, that's <laughs> but that's what I'm made. curious. Is there though? I, I don't know. They always want more. You, you know, know what I bet though? I bet with guys who are like that successful, they start to think about areas of their lives that they have neglected Mm -hmm. and so like maybe it's not money anymore it's like relationships yeah makes total sense there's something else that they can be focusing on or Mm -hmm. be yeah but that's um and eliminating that helps you know because like you said it's like not thinking oh what they have is what i want versus well what do you want and and just focus on getting there and you'll Mm -hmm. get there and have a better mindset throughout the way well and i've heard like comparison is the thief of all joy Mm -hmm. right and and the reason is that like you said you can always find somebody who has done better or Mm -hmm. has done more than you Mm -hmm. and do you want to always live your life like looking at somebody else or it's like Mm. look at what I have like Mm -hmm. I can almost think about it as like I open my treasure box every day and it's like wow you know I've got a family that I love Mm -hmm. I'm in a house I'm safe I'm building a company I love and it's like this is my treasure box Mm -hmm. and I I cherish it and it's really important to me and it makes me happy every day Mm -hmm. and it is completely non-contingent on anybody else Mm -hmm. And I just feel like that's what a lot of these like tribes in in like really remote places or like you look at some of the happiest countries in the world, you look at the way that those people there live and it's because they have an attitude of gratitude every mm-hmm. day. Like they, they find things to be grateful for yeah, and they find reasons to find joy in just daily living. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we, especially as Americans, like 
needs so much more of that. Yeah, like an like an app that actually generates revenue, which <laughs> is not as common as you think. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. that's like that's huge. That's why I'm afraid of software because I don't know how they make money a lot of times. I'm sure you could figure it out. <laughs> you know, but you, that's so that's some definitely to be proud of. Is an app that already has consistent users is er, this early is pretty awesome. Yeah. And and you've built a uh, a chassis with potential of growth and in, in revenue. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's great. Thank you. So there it is. Allison Roberts, faster size, master shiver sizer. And you can see here she took the time to teach some of my team members how to do shiver sizing. And you could see by the end of the video how out of breath they are. And as you can see, this is something you can literally do anywhere. You can do it in your office. You could do it at home. You can do it literally any point of the day. You could do it while waiting in line at the grocery store if you're into that kind of thing. It's a fun and exciting way to lose and burn quick calories on the go. I think Allison's done an incredible job building this business. The app and the software is very well done. It's really easy to navigate. And then going through all the videos that she does where she educates you how to use it are so well done. She's so well spoken. And I think what they've built is something very nice. But going through the conversation, I can really appreciate appreciate what she's done and how she's, you know, raised venture capital to build this business. She's hired top-notch team members to build this out. She's taking structural criticism well, like changing the brand. That's like a big decision. And the fact that she's doing that and acknowledging those needs is, you know, that's a big deal. And I respect that. It's hard to do that as a founder. I also like one of her field notes there about focusing on your internal motivators and not your external motivators. At the end of the day, what you do on a day-by-day basis should be for you, not for someone else, especially when you're building a business. You know, you can get advice and you can get input from many entrepreneurs and founders and investors and so on and so forth, but you know, you don't have to take it. You can you can always focus on what is important to you and you don't need to change your mind because someone convinces you otherwise. You can keep focusing on what you want to focus on and find those internal motivations and stick to that. Always turn back to the data. Great point. Agreed. Same with consumer products. When you're, you know, you have thousands of units out there and you're looking at feedback from customer service, you know, all that stuff makes makes sense when you're making a decision about a product. You know, the data doesn't lie. And then same, of course, in her situation with an app, you collect so much data as they're using the product and you can see what they're interacting with, what they're not, so on and so forth. But relying on that data is important and using that to make decisions will usually provide a better result. It's, you know, gut decisions don't really do much. Great point. Focused on the actions and not the results. I think it's day by day. If you constantly focus on results when results might not happen that quickly, which it's hard to stay motivated if you're looking at results that can take months and months and months versus if you focus on the fact that you did check those boxes in that day, that's what matters. So if you consistently are focusing on that, then you will be more successful and more positive about what you're doing and it'll help continue to motivate you. Okay, that was it. Allison Roberts, thanks for coming on. It was a great discussion. As always, we'll be out with another episode next week where we talk to the founder of Beehive Meals, Elise Jackson. And you can find us on all the streaming platforms for podcasts as well as YouTube and all the other social media spots. So thanks for listening. Stay tuned for next week's episode. 